Welcome back to the Tinkerage. Uh, actually, no, not the Tinkerage, it's the kitchen. Today, it's going to be about some cooking. And this is my little black book. Unlike some people's little black books, this is not about past conquests. This is the place where I stored quotes and recipes, and this contains the secret family recipe. But I, before I start, I want to read a little quote. This is from a poem called In Passive by Brian Harris, written in 1967. To be born in Wales, not with a silver spoon in your mouth, but with music in your blood, and with poetry in your soul, is a privilege indeed. I've not lived in Wales for many years now, but I was born in Wales, and I do consider it a privilege. And there's parts of being Welsh that just lives in your soul. In Wales, they call it hereth, belonging be part of Wales, and in Wales as part of you. Now, Maker Central, a short while ago, I took along some Welsh cakes as kind of an edible maker coin, and they were quite popular. A lot of people asked for the recipe. Now, it's a secret family recipe, so don't tell anyone, but I'm going to share it with you. Now, this recipe is very old. It's many generations old. So I'm going to take you through the main ingredients, and I'll try and give you the conversions as well. And I'll put that up on the screen. We have eight ounces, that's 227 grams, or approximately two cups of self-raising flour. Now that's slightly different from American self-rising flour. From what I can understand, if you take, uh, if you're American, if you take some, for every cup of flour that you need, if you add about one and a half to two teaspoons of baking powder to all-purpose flour, you should get something that's very similar. Now, some recipes call for adding half a teaspoon of salt per cup. Now, this is not a salty recipe, so that's something that you might want to adjust to your own particular palate. Okay, just a note about flour. So this recipe is easily adaptable for those that are celiac or gluten intolerant. All I do is substitute for exactly the same quantity with a gluten-free self-raising flour. Now, for those based in the UK, I cannot recommend enough the free, uh, free from uh, flowers by Doves Farm. They're really good. The only thing you need to do, because it doesn't bind quite so well with that gluten, is add a little bit of xanthan gum, again, from Dove Farm. For the eight ounces of flour that you need for this, the 227 grams, add about a quarter to half a teaspoon of xanthan gum. Then we've got four ounces of butter. Uh, that's about 113 grams, or approximately half a cup. You could use margarine. I prefer to use butter. I think it gives a much better flavor than margarine. But again, do what works for you and what you have. Then we have three ounces, 84 grams of sugar. Now this is granulated sugar. You could use caster sugar, but granulated is fine. Now that's about three eighths of a cup. Then we have two ounces, 56 grams of dried currants. Now, dried currants aren't really black currants have been dried. They're a, a tiny little grape, uh, much smaller than the grapes you'd use for raisins. You could substitute with raisins, but if you have a choice, maybe go for a smaller raisins rather than kind of large, plump raisins. You could also substitute other things such as chocolate chips. Uh, that does give a few little issues. Now, you could use sultanas. And then we have one large egg. Uh, you can use a medium egg if there's not quite enough fluid. Uh, you can always add a little bit of milk to bind everything together. Now, the first stage of the process in making Welsh cakes is to combine the flour and the butter. You can do this two ways. One is to put them both into a bowl and then get your fingers in and rub them together until you have like fine breadcrumbs. It's not a quick process. It takes at least five minutes, but you're probably close to ten minutes in order to do that, to get it really nice and fine. So a much quicker way to do it is to use a food processor. Okay, if you're going to do this by hand, I thoroughly recommend don't use really cold butter. Make sure that it's warmed up to that room temperature. But you don't want it really soft either, otherwise it's just going to be really difficult to, to work. A food processor does make it far, far quicker. And you do end up with some really nice, almost like breadcrumbs. But it's not critical. Doing it by hand is fine and actually quite a cathartic process, a bit like making bread. So 
So after a few seconds in the food processor or a few minutes by hand, you should get something that looks like fine breadcrumbs. If your hands are warm and you're doing it, you might find that they bind together in quite big chunks. That's not a problem. Next stage, add the sugar, add the currants or raisins. If you were adding uh, chocolate chips, this would be a good time to do it. Uh, some people add mixed spice. A lot of recipes call for that. I do use that sometimes, but most of the time I don't. It's not in the family recipe, but it is something that is in quite a lot of recipes if you look at them online. This needs then just mixing together. You may as well use your hands because your hands are going to get more messy. If you're using dried fruit, just make sure that it's not clumping together like that. So just mix that through. And then just make a little well in the center. Give the egg a good beat. And pour it into the well in the center. And this is where your hands are going to get messy because now that all has to be combined. It will start off looking like it's not going to all mix in. Now you're not kneading this in the same way that you would bread. This is purely about combining it. It's very similar to making cookie dough. Now when I was at university, I would always make double sized batches because half of it would get cooked and half of it would get eaten. So if you like raw cookie dough, you'll probably like this. Now, something I've never tried, but I might give it a try. And I was talking to Ginny Claggett at Maker Central. She was talking, saying how she will put cookie dough into the freezer so that she can make Bob and their children cookies very easily, very quickly. Now, I suspect that this would work. Now, it's going to stick to your hands like this. Either way, just pull it off. And then mix that in. Now this is now a little bit sticky. If you use a smaller egg, it might still be a little bit dry. If it was a little bit dry, add a little bit of milk until you get something that's going to hold together. Now at this stage, because it's a little bit sticky, it's a bit too sticky to actually work easily, I will add a little bit of flour onto that until it becomes something that's not going to stick to my hands. Now this is not done by measure. Literally just shake some flour in, cover it over, and just work it round. And it should come off your hands. And you want something that, like cookie dough, is just going to hold together really nicely. So once we've got that, we need to roll that out. So I normally do it in kind of half batches, just because I tend to roll out on a chopping board to save making too much mess. On the worktops. If you've got bigger worktops or with boards, you can do that. So I just tend to put a bit of flour down first of all. Take that, just roll it around in the flour. So we're going to roll this out and just use a I just use a wooden rolling pin. So I'm rolling that out to about one centimetre thick, just under half an inch thick. Thickness you make it isn't too important. Uh, if you make it too thick, they're not going to cook in the centre at all. If you make them too thin, uh, they'll just crumble away like biscuits. The size of cutter you use, or even the shape of cutter, is completely up to you. I tend to use these two cutters. Right, for making gluten-based ones, I use the large ring. That's about two and a half inches. You could make a three inch size, I wouldn't go above that personally. For the smaller Welsh cakes that are for non-gluten, so gluten-free Welsh cakes, I tend to use this smaller ring which is about a two inch ring. How many you get depends on the thickness. So just cut them out. Now they will lift up. Now I'm going to cut a few out and just put them on the side. Ready to cook. Generally when I'm cooking a batch for consumption at home, then I will 
cut them to go straight into the pan. The remainders can just get pulled back together and added to the other half. Traditionally these are cooked on a cast iron griddle. Anywhere between kind of three quarters, half to three quarters of an inch thick to an inch thick. These are often passed down in families. Uh, our family one is, I believe, with my sister and she's older than me. I'm using a, a Maya pancake pan. I've had this for quite a long time, as you can tell from the state of the non-stick. It's uh, quite thick. A heavy base frying pan will do well. Non-stick is best. You need to get that quite hot. You want it too hot, so I'll put it on a, a medium flame. The thicker the pan, the more heat stays in the pan when you put them on. But you think it's warm enough, pop it on. Depending on the size of your pan, depending on the size of your Welsh cakes, three to four. If I'm cooking the larger Welsh cakes in this pan, I'll put only three. For these smaller ones, I'll put four. Sometimes the first few, if you don't get the heat quite right, the first few might not come out quite so well, but they tend to come out better afterwards. I've greased that with a little bit of butter, as you saw. Once they've been down for a minute or so, just check, see what they're like. Gluten-free ones particularly can be a little bit soft and can break. So I tend to use something like a, a fish slice. And these, perfectly browned. Now if you buy these from shops, they tend to be overcooked. The trick is to just ever so slightly undercook them. And mostly that's about getting the thickness just right. Want them just to finish off with their own heat on a cooling rack once you're done. Also in shops they just cover them with sugar. That's not quite traditional to cover them with sugar after they have been cooked. And it takes a few seconds for the other half to brown off. So you can see, lovely and brown on both sides. You can see they're still quite moist at the edge. And the gluten-free ones do tend to be a little bit more fragile. If you find they're burning, then either you're leaving them too long, or you need to maybe turn the heat down a little bit. Obviously this is going to depend on your particular stove. Now if you've got a, a cast iron arger, the arger plates tend to have a, a fixed temperature so you're going to need to watch your timing carefully. If you're cooking multiple batches then you do need to butter in between. I tend to not grease again. So I go straight from the ring normally, this is the second batch, straight into the pan, it's smoking hot, that's okay. Little known fact in the UK, if you cook on gas, your gas pressure will change depending on how many people are also cooking at the same time. So there we go, the two inch cutter, five centimeters, has made 22 delicious looking Welsh cakes. Hang on, family are out. 21. Mmm. The only thing better than a Welsh cake is a warm Welsh cake.